Great. So Frank DeMaio, the stage is yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Hold on. Let me just make sure I got this uh, set up right. All right. And everyone can see my screen now? We see you fine. Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So um, a couple of things. So yes, I'm going to be talking about the development of uh, Rosetta Fold All Atom, a model, a machine learning model for predicting general biomolecular structure. Um, also, if you have questions, I want this to be more interactive. I only have 35, 40 minutes or so planned to talk. So please, please interrupt me if there are questions or comments or anything uh, throughout the talk. So I guess to get started, started, I'll give a very quick introduction to Rosetta Fold. So Rosetta Fold, of course, was this machine learning model uh, that was published, I guess, several years ago, back at the uh, back in 2021, a structure prediction model, right? A machine learning structure prediction model, uh, similar in some respects to um, to AlphaFold, right? Where again, you're going from MSA, uh, a multiple sequence alignment of a protein that you want to predict uh, to produce a three dimensional structure. Uh, of the model. Um, and I think, I'm not sure, I'm going to rush through this because I assume most people ha are familiar uh, with some of this work, uh, but more recently, so this was spearheaded by uh, Ming Young Bake, a postdoc uh, in David Baker's group. Um, she recently started her own lab and um, we've been working on trying to basically close the performance gap between AlphaFold 2 and Rosetta Fold. Um, and through a number of changes, um, basically a combination of borrowing ideas and features from AlphaFold's model, uh, keeping some of the principles that we had developed in the original RosettaFold model, as well as uh, novel features like this sort of new pair-to-pair -pair update that we developed, we were able to kind of close this performance gap um, between RosettaFold and AlphaFold. And so now we are finding that RosettaFold 2, what we call RosettaFold 2, the latest RosettaFold model, um, seems to be performing in line with that of AlphaFold. Um, yeah, and I, we compare this now uh, to a number of different, you know, there's been a number of different um, protein structure prediction approaches, right? Um, and when we compare them on a very recent subset of structures, um, and these are a very recent subset of structures that are newer than the training sets of all of these different approaches. So we can be sure that they're in, kind of independent validation examples, we find that, again, Rosetta Fold is in line with all of the other monomer structure prediction methods. Hold on, let me get a pointer up here. In line with all these monomer structure prediction methods, and as well for protein complexes, again, it's in line, maybe slightly behind alpha fold multimer, um, but in line. Furthermore, because this is a completely different architecture, we don't have these expensive L-cubed triangle attention updates, this model scales quite a bit better um, than AlphaFold. So that's exciting, right? But obviously there's a lot of approaches now that can accurately predict protein structure. And so what we've been interested in, and I guess one of the reasons that we kind of underwent this large scale effort was to try to understand how to train a model like this. And so what we have been interested in is extending this now, extending this model to, um, oh, sorry. So this, sorry, this right here, is our um, complete model. Um, again, it's we like to think of it as, and I'm going to explain this because I think this stuff comes up a little bit later, um, but it's basically a three-track um, model. So you have essentially, the way we think of it is there's like three different representations of the protein that we're simultaneously updating, right? So there's these three different tracks. They're iteratively updating their representation of the protein. That includes a one-dimensional track where, again, you're kind of featurizing the sequence a two-dimensional track where you're featurizing residue pair interactions, right? And then finally a 3D track where you're representing the actual kind of current guess of the 3D structure. And the model itself is iteratively improving these estimates, right? As well as passing information back and forth to ensure consistency between these, right? So then getting back to what I was saying before, we are interested now in, now that we, think we understand how to train this. We were interested in further extending this. And so the first thing that we tried to do to extend this, I think the obvious extension was to predict protein nucleic acid complexes, right? So um, nucleic acids in some respects, again, it's a linear polymer, they're very analogous to uh, amino acids. And so we can put these, um, put this idea into the Rosetta Fold model relatively easily, 
right? So for example, the alphabet that's in the 1D track, the sequence track, the alphabet now you add, instead of, its, instead of just being the 20 amino acids, it now also contains the eight, uh, you know, RNA and DNA bases, right? And then similarly in the 2D track, you know, you define, again, the 2D track is reasoning over geometries. Geometries are defined with respect to sort of backbone coordinate frames. And so you can extend that definition to include, um, you know, coordinate frames derived from nucleotides. And then finally, in the 3D track, and this is kind of shown in the upper right, you need a way of kind of building up. So predicting, you know, essentially, you're just predicting numbers and then building those numbers into a representation of nucleic acid structure, right? So this was conceptually very, very simple, right? When we did this, though, we weren't sure whether or not, um, there essentially, there's 1 20th of the training data um, for protein nucleic acid complexes compared to proteins. Again, when you look at it in terms of number of clusters of, of structure that are available, um, and I'll have some more information later on that. And so we weren't sure how well that would work, right? And so it turns out, to cut a long story <laughs> relatively short, it turns out it works reasonably well. Um, so I am showing, so I'm just going to move this zoom panel here so I can see a little better. Um, so I'm showing here on the right. So we've tested this then on, so we basically trained this model with data up to, um, I think it was like middle of 2021 and then validated this model on all of the protein nucleic acid complexes that have been, uh, developed since then. We're plotting them on this plot where we're showing, um, on the X axis, how similar they are to anything the model was trained on in terms of sequence identity. So just the E value, everything in this right here, you can think of as kind of completely unique. It's not detectable by sequence uh, homology. And then I'm showing this FNAT measure, which is just a Capri measure for measuring interface quality. You kind of can think of this as 0.5 as a successful um, prediction. What we find is that, you know, there is a dependence. Uh, obviously it does, the model does better on things that it's trained on but it is able to generalize to some extent. And we see a success rate of maybe 35% at predicting the interface of novel, completely novel structures. Um, and furthermore, we're predicting the accuracy like AlphaFold and like RosettaFold. We can predict the we can predict how accurate our predictions are. And that is fairly robust uh, in return uh, with respect to the actual accuracy. And so what we again find is that we identify roughly 30 to 35% of structures that we can predict with high confidence. And then of those, 90% of them are correct. All right, and so this is um, something that we're still working on. And I'll touch back on this at the end. But of course, what I came to talk about was then further extending this model that could model everything in the PDB, all biomolecules, right? And so of course, um, there are, you know, of the structures that have been solved, right? There are obviously a lot of, there's a lot more than just proteins and nucleic acids, right? There's chemically modified groups, right? There's metals, there's proteins, small molecules, small molecule cofactors. Um, and all of these things, you know, presumably are, would be really, really important and useful uh, to predict. All right, and so, yeah, again, I just want to kind of walk through some of the things we were thinking before developing this model. So there's a number of different different ways um, that this model could be represented, that you can think about representing this model, right? And so the idea is Rosetta Fold itself reasons, kind of, I think of this, the central unit of Rosetta Fold is the residue, right? It's reasoning on, it's 1D track, your tokens correspond to amino acid residues, the 2D track are residue interactions, the 3D track it's like doing graph convolutions where nodes are residues. And so it's very residue centric. And so the ideas that we had are, so now we have uh, arbitrary chemicals. We don't, there's just not enough examples. There's too much diversity to treat them as residues. And so the way we thought of this is there's kind of three different ways we can go about doing this. So the first would be just model this using an atomic representation. So model, replace the sort of, residue centric view with an uh, atomic and atom centric view. And that allows, you know, very naturally to build arbitrary biomolecules, right? Another way to think of this is to do separate models, right? Is to have a model that can build protein that works in residue space. And then a second model that can take that model and build on top of that. And there's been some work in this respect um, and I'll show it to you. But the third way and what we ultimately decided on was this idea of joint modeling where you have a hybrid model entities 
are both residues and atoms. And the model is trained to learn residue, residue interactions, residue, atom interactions, atom, atom interactions. Looking at you know previous approaches to this, I think most uh, approaches that have been published, so this, right, uh, there's three different examples that have been shown here, have all really been focused on the problem of ligand docking and on virtual screening. And so they've opted for something that I think is most similar to this sequential modeling, where they assume there's a model of a protein and maybe that model needs to be refined, but ultimately they're starting with a model of the protein. They're starting with uh, a, a pocket where that protein um, wants to, you know, where that pro protein is kind of expected uh, to be placed. Some of these, I guess, do do global docking, but basically the idea is that you, it's a really a sequential model, right? And so, yeah, again, like it says here, there's separate basically branches for predicting protein and predicting small molecule. Um, and that's kind of, we wanted to avoid that for a number of reasons. I think there's a number of advantages to predicting both things simultaneously. I think certainly for to being able to predict you know, uh, binding induced conformational changes in protein. You, you could think doing this simultaneously is is uh, more likely uh, to be successful. Um, so then I wanted to talk about real quick. Uh, one of the things that we did consider early in this process was this first model, this atomic representation. Uh, and so this is not work done by me, but this is a uh, uh, Avon in the IPD um, developed uh, ChemNet, which is essentially a version of Kind of Rosetta Fold, or at least a Rosetta Fold-like architecture, I would say. Again, the three-track architecture that works in um, that works in atomistic space. Um, and so, the problem with this approach, and this approach works, you know, reasonably well as might be expected. But the problem with this approach seems is as might you might expect is scaling. Right? Is is you can't really scale this approach. So memory usage now, everything is with respect to the number of atoms and not the number of uh, residues anymore. And so it doesn't scale too, too well. So it can you can model fairly large pockets, but you can't, for example, fold an entire protein um, with this approach. Um, and so this kind of led us to uh, what we wanted to do uh, and Rosetta Fold All Atom, which is to basically build this hybrid model where we're reasoning over both atoms of some arbitrary chemical structure and amino acids or nucleotides. Um, of some uh, linear uh, structure. All right, so I kind of wanted to go through some of the details. And again, I'm happy to take questions on this part at all. But I wanted to go through some of the details of the changes because this, unlike the nucleic acid, this wasn't exactly straightforward to incorporate this into a Rosetta Fold-like network. And so I wanted to walk through some of the changes. I'll go through them in, at sort of a higher level here and then I will go into some of the details of the details. So first of all, the alphabet, again, it's a hybrid model. So we have both amino acids, DNA and RNA bases, but we now also have atom tokens in here. And so now because atoms can be connected um, arbitrarily, we need to provide the network information on what atoms are bonded together. What are the bond distances between atoms, right? Um, and so that is done through the two-dimensional, through the 2D track of this model. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a second. Finally, chirality. So chirality is really important. Again, just from connectivity, bond types alone, chirality is an additional feature. It's tricky because it's this multi-body feature that, again, needs to take into account uh, the position of several different atoms. It doesn't really cleanly go into the 2D track. And so what we ended up doing is putting this chirality feature into the 3D track, where it's really relatively easy to describe orientations via the 3D track. Um, and I'll talk about that um, in a second. And then finally, the last thing that I wanted to talk about were the losses. So the loss function now also that we use needs to handle this hybrid representation. Um, so let me look at talk about some of these things in a little bit of detail. So again, I think it's it's pretty straightforward. The MSA is, is that now we're building. So this is for, say, modeling a protein small molecule complex. The MSA itself contains the protein MSA and then essentially a list of the tokens or individual elements. So we don't do any kind of atom typing here, mm -hmm. but the tokens of this molecule are simply the element types of all of the contained molecules. In terms of actually generating the multiple sequence alignment, currently we, I mean, there's not a way that we know of that 
general that will allow us to compute uh, kind of an MSA for uh, individual atoms in some small molecule. And so what we just do is we just always model the atomistic parts in single sequence mode, right? So we always have a single sequence for the ligand and then it's unaligned to everything else. The other thing that we do, again, a slight detail of this, of this network is, so one of the big parts in training for both AlphaFold and RosettaFold was that it's learned, the model has learned to predict sequence. You always in training mask um, some fraction of the sequence, I think it's typically 15% of this of the amino acid sequence gets masked. And then the network um, is tasked, the 1D track is tasked, tasked, excuse me, with recovering those sequences. In our initial training, at least, we didn't do any masking of non-amino acid features. So we don't do any element masking. Again, at the very, very end, I'll talk about uh, that a little bit. But in this initial run, we didn't, we only mask. So it's it's oh, we're always giving it a perfect definition of the ligand itself. Could I ask one thing? Like, yeah. Is, if, if you, if I remember correctly, you have like thirty-six different atom types or something like that. Like, yeah. The, I, mean, I know that the uh, new model, when Patrick Bryan's version, they only have you seven. Is, is there? I mean, did you try different uh, clustering, or did you just took everything you found, or did you consider different things there? Sorry, what? What do you? Can you repeat that? Uh, yeah. But basically, why did you end up with the the number of atom types that you used at the end? Oh, yeah, there, we elements. So we just did elements basically yeah, elements. in this model. So it was just elements, and it was literally, I think it was every element that we had at least 10 instances of okay. in training. Yeah. Because all the carbons are not going to be the same. You could, you could, you could speak oh, carbons exactly. in different and, so the, the, and, and this was a big question when we were initially setting this out. Like, do we actually do, do we treat this like a force field and give it atom types and hybridization and things like that? Our opinion was to try to let the model figure this out. Um, so it's just, at least at the atom level, it's just elements. So the bond geometry, which allows it to give a little bit more complexity. So, right. So again, normally, so normally in Rosetta fold, your amino acid sequence is given to the network. And then in the pair track, there's this positional embedding that says two amino acids, how far apart they are in linear sequence, right? Everything's connected in a, you know, from N to C terminus. It's relatively straightforward. Obviously, atoms can be connected in, ar in an arbitrary graph, right? So what we have done um, is to basically provide that bond graph to the network as an additional pair feature. So this is something that wasn't provided in the original Rosetta fold. Um, and I'm showing an example of that here, right? So you have a protein and you have a your ligand part of the structure, right? And so the way that this graph works is obviously the protein, there's just you know, it's connected from N to C terminus. So everything is connected to I plus one in this case, right? And then within the at, within the re residue itself, the bonds are all explicitly specified. So we do a relatively simple bond typing where it's just, I think it's just right, single, double, triple aromatic bonds. Um, and then we have two kind of special bond types. So within residues, there's a bond, it's like a, you know, modeling the peptide bond, but it, because it's between residues, it's sort of different. It's not really, I mean, even though chemically, <laughs> right? Chemically, it's, it's a double bond. It's, it's, um, it's treated as something special in the network. And then also, because we're modeling non-canonic amino acids, you have things where atomized components are bonded to residuized components. And so there's a special bond type for that connection as well. All right. Um, and so that's given to the network. And like I said, we also have positional encoding, right? So the idea is the pair, the pair part of the network gets a feature that says, I'm an element IJ. What is the residue? What is the linear distance between I and J of a protein? Again, for um, atomized regions and for particularly atomized regions that are connected to proteins regions, right? That definition gets complicated. So what we ended up doing is essentially coming up with two different distances. There's a residue distance, right? Which is signed, which has the direction towards the N terminus and the C terminus. And then there's an atom distance, right? That the number of bonds, it's always positive. The number of bonds away 
between two atoms. And it's, again, if there's cycles, it's just the shortest path. So it's the shortest number of bonds connecting two atoms together. Um, the residue distance we cap at minus 32 and plus 32 following alpha fold. So the network doesn't see numbers larger than 32. For the atom distance, we cap things, and this is sort of an arbitrary decision. A lot of these things that I'm gonna mention are sort of not super, um, you know, we, we talked about it and we tried to think what made sense, but we didn't test a lot of different values for this, but we capped the atom distance at eight bonds. So anything more than eight bonds just is eight bonds away. And then finally, for these hybrid models, it sees both. So the distance between A and say, atom D, right, is going to be two residues forward, right? So plus two residues, and then three bonds. So the number of bonds along the bond graph that it counts to get to D, one, two, three. And so it sees this hybrid representation. So it knows basically when you have a residue and an atom, how many residues away is this? And then how many bonds away is this? And this seemed to be kind of the best way. We gave this some thought, um, and this seemed to be kind of the best way to kind of capture this sort of positional encoding. Okay, the last thing, chirality. This is way, way, way too much detail. The basic idea with chirality, so you have chiral centers, right? And the network, with all the other features that we give it, the network has no way of knowing. And so originally, we actually trained this model without a chirality feature. Um, and the model would basically learn to predict whatever chirality it was more commonly trained with. Right. Like, I mean, you could imagine it might be useful if you don't know and you want to predict what chirality binds. The network didn't seem to be able to do that to any extent. It just always predicted the most common chirality that it saw in training. Um, so this was challenging. And we talked about a number of different ways to encode this in the network. Um, but it, because it is like a multi-body term, it doesn't really cleanly encode in the 2D track, which is really just pairwise features. And so what we ended up doing is putting this into the 3D track, where basically for each chiral center, right, we build ideal positions for each of the atoms, each of the four connected atoms, based on the other three. And then we give that offset to the 3D track as an input. So if a model is built in the wrong chirality, the 3D track at that layer gets an input that points that atom towards where it needs to go. Um, and so in that way, it makes it relatively easy to specify chirality. And it turns out the model respects that um, very, very well. It was relatively easy to, um, again, to code that up. So, okay. So I think that's all the pieces. I guess, are there any questions at this point on Rosetta Fold all atom architecture, right? The way, I mean, this figure I think shows everything. It shows the different, that again, you get your multiple sequence alignment, right? This is the normal Rosetta Fold input, your templates. And then you concatenate that with all of this molecular information, the element types, right? The bond types, and then you can build this bond. I guess it's not really shown here, but this bond distance graph. And then finally, the chiral centers that go into the 3D track. Okay. Uh, well, with that, then I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I will tell, yeah, it looks good to me. It's like, it's okay. Clear. Excellent. Unless excellent. someone else has some questions. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll, we can ask at the end too. Um, so, all right. So then training data for this. Uh, so we collected, so basically our goal was to use as much data as there is, right? So we basically went to the PDB and we collected this amount of data and these amount of clusters. And I forget what our clustering cut off. So the clustering was, I will say the clustering was all protein centric. So we clustered everything at the protein level. Um, so these clusters are, they're not, I mean, for small molecules, again, there's different, it wasn't clear, but when we, so the idea is that when we sample, we sample uniformly from clusters. And so we just, we chose to do things at the protein cluster level uh, in that case. And you can see that, again, there's a decent number of protein small molecule complexes and protein metal complexes. It's still small compared to the number of proteins and protein complexes, but it's better than, than the kind of nucleic acid cases, where again, you see like 1 20th of the number of proteins here. It's more like one quarter. That said, there was very, very little diversity in terms of small molecules. There's like a ton, a ton of nucleotide triphosphates, for example, that just, you know, don't give you, whereas less common ligands, you you really don't see that many of. Um, and so 
what we wanted to do was to try to, we were very concerned about overfitting, like even right at the outset, before we even started training, we were super concerned about overfitting. And so we tried to think about other sources of data that we could use to generate kind of augment our training data. And the first of these was to use small molecule data from, from CSD. Um, and there we picked, uh, we basically picked 40,000 clusters of molecules that are predicted just as the small molecule itself uh, in isolation. Right. Um, and then so that kind of the hope was that would, again, the the kind of ligands that are explored in protein ligand complexes are small. This would maybe give the model a better sense of how ligands of ligand geometry. The downside is it doesn't include ligand protein. This this data set obviously doesn't include any ligand protein interactions. And so it would teach us part of the model. It wasn't clear. And I'll talk more about that later. Once I talk about the training, the other thing that we did was this idea of atomization, right? Where we have tons of proteins, proteins do contain atoms. And so what we did is during training, some fraction of the time, we took some fraction of residues from a protein, from a pure protein and treated them as if they were a small molecule. So we, um, yeah, basically we converted its representation from the residue representation to the atom representation. And then when we did that, again, we wanted the model to learn, obviously, without seeing MSA, we wanted the model to learn at the end of the day chemistry. And so we also took the MSA features away from that. So there was some concern on this that like, so it gives us the plus the advantage of this is it gives us like a lot of a lot of opportunity to see many different atomized features. The problem is they're all amino acids. And we were concerned that using this data too much might teach that. I mean, the network might implicitly learn protein, you know, amino acid geometries anyway. It might learn something that wouldn't generalize to non-protein entities. Um, and so we were concerned about that. And so in the initial trading run, we actually did this at a relatively low frequency. Um, I would guess yeah. that most of the ligands are also sort of, I mean, car carbon rings and... Uh... Yeah, so... That, well, that was the, right. That's the advantage of this is that this a lot of native ligands look a lot like amino acids, right? The concern, I think, was more that it would like literally memorize, you know, rotomer probabilities and things like that in a way that it wouldn't transfer, even if you just added one small chemical group to it, that it would really, because these networks are super good at memorizing things. Mm -hmm. And we learned that when we did the nucleic acid, like it was really challenging to get it to get, I mean, again, like with, with the RNA structures, it would memorize, I mean, it could, given, you know, given the right network, it could literally memorize everything in the training set and give you perfect predictions. And then you transfer that and it gives you garbage. Um, so we were very concerned going in. I think it may be, maybe a little overly concerned in the case of small molecules, um, but yeah. And then the last, this, so this strategy, is then the same strategy that we used for covalent modification. So basically what we did is whenever we had a chemically modified amino acid, we atomized the entire amino acid itself. So it's kind of like the, always that protein, always the residue atomized connection always occurs along the protein backbone. It's always a peptide bond. So again, you have a glycosylated residue. It's not just the sugar that's atomized, but the residue that's connected to it as well. Yes, a detailed yeah. thing because I mean, normally for side chains, you yeah. do that at the end in the structure module, you just predict chi, chi angles. And so, yeah. so normally you just treat it as, as a C alpha, basically. So, sorry, normally what? I mean, what last... Normally for a protein residue. Yeah. In, in the network part, it's just treated as a single C alpha, basically. Correct, correct. So, normally, normal, like I said, and, and that's the difference. When you're atomizing, so normally, Everything except the very, very end is basically, I mean, it's sort of, I like to think of it because it is, there's an orientation. So it, but it's really N C alpha C is what yeah. it's modeling normally yeah. for proteins. Yeah. In this case, the whole network now, it's modeling every atom in here. And I should mention, we don't model hydrogen atoms explicitly in the atomized representation of this. So it is just the non-hydrogen atoms. Um, and that was largely chosen for performance reasons of the network. Um, I think there were some very early experiments where we included hydrogens and at least very early, it didn't seem to make much of a difference and it just slowed things down significantly. I think the model definitely learns, I think it learns the protonation state of residues pretty well. And in fact, we built 
from this models that predict protonation state and they work you know quite well i would say i mean it's good uh, yes the yeah. other curious question did, did you include yeah. water no we do not include water molecules in here we do not and the idea again is that the network should learn implicitly where these water molecules are we also tried our best efforts to remove like crystallographic artifact things that were again products of crystallization so buffer molecules and things like that that's fuzzy we basically made like a blacklist of of things of of molecules that we didn't include in modeling at all we did include of course metal ions um um and cases like that but again we tried to exclude crystallographic buffers you know um, so, so, salts, so li things like that, yeah. I mean, uh, ligands for lipid, yeah, I think, okay. yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, so, yeah. exactly. So we tried to, again, we're trying to capture, and again, we definitely did not do this perfectly. Um, we, it just kind of came up. A, a lot of this was just sort of looking through a bunch of examples and trying to come up with rules that threw out the things we didn't want modeled. We definitely, we did not model water molecules explicitly, though. Um, the, the, and that's something yeah. from from Stefane Gagné. Uh, yeah. Uh, she she uh, or he asks that uh, uh, about the dihydrogen like, bonds, so cysteine cysteine bonds. Did you, how do you treat them? That's a great question, actually. So the original version of this model, the original training run that I'm going to talk about today, um, we did not atomize disulfide. They actually were just excluded from atomization. So it wasn't that we didn't connect; we just never atomized them. The latest version of the model, anyway. Long story short, we're, we're doing some. We were doing some modeling projects with like short, highly disulfided proteins. And it turns out that it's really useful to have the model trained on that feature. So the latest version of this model now is trained on where the disulfide is fully, <clears throat> fully atomized, including the disulfide connection itself. And that seems to, like I said, make a pretty big difference when you're actually modeling uh, disulfide connection. So the issue is that the current network, it respects disulfide. So if you have a predict something with a disulfide, it respects that, but it messes up the geometry of that. Uh, and it produces something that's not like th the lengths are right, but it's not physically very reasonable. And so these later versions of the model that have been trained, I should, I wish I brought slides on. I was actually going to include slides on that, but I didn't. But the later version of the model, if it's trained on that, it does a much better job at recapitulating the, those geometries. All right. So hold on. All right. So then loss function. So Alpha fold. I think this is one of the smartest things that the uh, the DeepMind team did was the loss function was this fate, this frame aligned point error. One of the tricky problems with with minimizing is you need to have some your predicted molecule and your native structure. You need to have some way of aligning them right in, in uh, of superposing them super excuse me superimposing them together. That's challenging to do when they're far away from each other, that there's obviously very simple solutions for this when the molecules are close, but when it's far. And so they came up with this frame aligned point error that basically tries aligning all pairs of, so it treats each atom, each residue as a coordinate frame and then tries align. It basically takes the average RMS using those alignment frames, residue one on your model to residue one on your prediction residue two on your model residue two on your prediction right so for residues that makes a ton of sense right you have a frame associated with each residue and you compute the uh you use that for the superimposition frame and then calculate your atom distances right uh what we came up with was this this is probably not the best slide to show this but we obviously when you have ligands you don't have they're just atoms there's no orientation so what we did is came up with this idea of generalized fate where we just explicitly consider all triples of atoms as as potential frames in this model. And so again, for example, you have this center around here, this is a frame, this is a frame, this is a frame, et cetera. Um, and so you consider then superimposing each of those frames in the same way that FAPE works, right? And it gets a... Um, and then, you know, you calculate fate loss in the normal way. So it's basically the average superimposing over all the frames in the molecule, right? So that's pretty straightforward. The tricky part with this was there's two different aspects. There's two different ways in which fate is used. So um, sort of throughout the model itself, we just use this backbone fate where frames just come from the backbone, right? And then at the end of the model, there's an all atom fate 
where the frames also include essentially all of the rotatable uh, side chains as well. So there's you know six um, six or seven again because it's side chains and then the backbone, the oxygen frame as well. There's like six or seven frames that are used uh, for amino acids. One of the problems was that this naive approach, if you look at all the angles in here, it's going to dominate the the um, the loss, right? You have a bunch of frames within your small molecule and then one frame per residue. And so what we do is during the backbone, we, we choose for each atom, essentially just a single frame. So each atom is the center of only a single frame in the backbone mode. And then in the side chain, and then in the sort of all atom mode at the very, very end, where we're computing many frames, we, we consider every single frame in the molecule. Again, that's sort of fuzzy, but the idea was we needed to generalize this loss to small molecules. All right, so these are the results. Um, so we trained this model, um, and there were, I guess, three different training runs that this model went through, three different full training runs where we kind of added these features in. And the, the, these results that I'm showing are from this third uh, training run. And I'll talk at the end, we're, we're not done with this. We're still pushing this forward and still trying additional things into the network. Um, but the first thing I wanted you to note is that this network itself doesn't do worse on protein structures. So protein monomer prediction, um, again, this is on, I think this is on the CASP, uh, actually the CASP 14 set, uh, which was again excluded from training. And again, what you can see is that the performance of the all atom model is you know, largely in line. Uh, this is just LDDTs, largely in line with Rosetta Fold 2, largely in line with Alpha Fold 2. All right. Um, but now, if we look at protein small molecule complex prediction, you can see there are some cases where this model does you know, quite a good job. And keep in mind, we're not just predicting the small molecule. We are folding everything at once. We're giving it amino acid sequence. We're giving it small molecule identity. It's figuring out how all of that comes together. And so there are definitely some cases, specifically looking at the... Um, the numbers that are shown here. So I'll show another slide that shows this in more detail, but essentially we see a success rate of around 30%. So 30% of the time we see ligands that are assigned to within two angstroms of where they are in the native structure. So relatively on the lower side, but again, it's a very, very difficult task. Um, again, folding the protein and the ligand in, in one shot. We see some aspects of... Um, we see some aspects of that the network does better when you show it things that are more similar to what it saw in training, but it's definitely learning some general principles. And so, yeah, what, what I'm plotting here is this is the average RMS, which probably isn't the best metric to show this, but I, I think the trends are, no matter what metric you look at, the trends are the same. And then what I'm showing is basically if there is a protein homolog or if there is a similar ligand in training, how well the network does. And so you can definitely see that there is a performance improvement when it sees something similar to what it saw before, but it's fairly subtle. I think the other thing that was even more interesting is that we can evaluate these structures on, um, on a, and this is, I should mention, this is a set, again, similar to what we did for the ligands. This is just a set of recent small molecules that were excluded from uh that were that were produced after the training data that we had, we had published one of the interesting things that we noticed and this is again not clear what what to make of this but we noticed that things so we have a model in in rosetta for calculating the predicted delta g of binding of these small molecules and so what we find is that the prediction is significantly better for things that are predicted to have a better binding affinity, which again, it so it's promising. I think it convinces us a little bit that the model is learning to some extent physics of this model, uh, physics of the, of the, excuse me, of the protein small molecule interface. Um, so I think, again, that's somewhat promising. I, I don't, I mean, there's, there, there are also sort of, again, these are more buried ligands. These are more surface ligands. And so maybe there's some other properties that are getting incorporated. But this is promising the model is at least learning something about, about physical interactions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you, 
it's not just I didn't talk about the nucleic acids, but all of the nucleic acid model is included in this. And so we can predict things again, ternary complexes of protein, ligand, uh, uh, you know, um, DNA in this case, or, or RNA um, are all again, it's possible now this this really this model is capable of understanding everything for the most part in the PDB. And so it can predict everything. Um, yeah. Co the other thing that we found is that it is uh, also this model is pretty good at predicting um, covalently modified uh, residues. And so, again, so in the PDB, there is a um, <laughs> not a ton of diversity. So many most modified things are glycosylated. Um, there are also a decent number of structures where, like, again, the enzyme is covalently attached, presumably for crystallization, but we have an enzyme that's covalently attached uh, to some ligand, and then there's just a mix of other things. Um, the model does um, pretty well at capturing those. You don't really see I, I, these numbers. So this is based, based on the type. So what we're reporting here, again, it's a different metric, but it's the LDT, LDDT of the interaction between the non-canonic amino acid, the chemically modified amino acid, and the rest of the protein. Um, and what you can see, not really a trend. Performance is, is pretty good. It's, it's how do I want to say here? It's difficult to convert these numbers. I'll show some figures in a second. It's difficult to convert these numbers, but these predictions are, I think, for the most part, pretty good. Again, above 0.8 is, is quite good um, in these cases. And again, we're seeing kind of a weak trend for... Oh, it does better when it sees things. I don't want to say this. It does better when it's things that are very similar to what it saw in training, but that effect is somewhat weak. So it's not a complete drop off. And we, again, you see this on the right are things most similar to what we saw in training. And, uh, and you can see there is a fall off here, but it still predicts things quite accurately that are very different than things it saw before. And so this is, uh, yeah. Randy had a question, Randy had a question. Yeah. It's like, if, if you treat your residues that have been atomized, how is the performance of that compared to normal residues? Do you do, I mean, if you- Oh, that's a great question. No, that is a great question. So what, what we see actually is, so the issue is it comes down to how we atomize. So when we atomize, at least in this training run, we only atomized at most five consecutive residues in the protein. In that case, we see essentially no drop off in terms of prediction, but five residues, it's not hard to sort of fill that in, I would say. We definitely, more recent models, we've, we now atomize, I think, up to 17 residues in an example. And there we see, we do see a slight drop off. It does seem, I will say, uh, Randy, it seems like the protein part of things, it has no problem with. And the error is mostly in the atomized part of things. Like you can delete, delete 17 random residues and the, the model will, tends to fold the protein. Again, the MSA information is pretty strong. It, it tends to do a good job uh, in terms of that. It does definitely have problems when you atomize long stretches of protein. It has problems building that part specifically, the, the atomized part. And part of it is we're, we're losing the MSA information there. Um, that's something, again, we're, we're kind of curious at looking at. One of the things that we want to try is, is atomizing larger things. Um, one of the things that we talked about was like things like disulfide loops, for example, using those and atomizing those entirely. So the network sees like large, again, if you want it to reason on these kind of large macrocyclic molecules, that could be something useful for that. Uh, yeah. Maria Kadukova had also a question about the, uh, the amount of MSA data and uh, how does that correlate with the, the ligand the prediction accuracy? So, oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, so the way it works is kind of the MSA information. We don't plot it, but I think probably uh, not really, I guess. Um, so the, basically what happens is the MSA affects protein accuracy and then protein accuracy affects ligand accuracy. And so, as you might expect, I think you see kind of the same fall off that you would see. So when the protein has fewer MSAs, ligand placement is worse. Likely it's worse because the protein, again, the pocket accuracy is not as good. The protein structure accuracy is, is loosened. And so consequently the ligand, it's hard to see. So, um, 
I, I think that's the, yeah, that's the net effect of things. And so I think, like I said, it, it tracks well with protein accuracy itself. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I want to show real quick. This is a movie that shows kind of, again, so we, I mentioned we have this 3D track. This is walking along. It's just a morph that shows the 3D track of what the model is learning um, as it goes. And so what, what we found, um, and it'll loop around again. But one of the things that we found that was interesting is the model tends to fold ligands very, very quickly. And then it kind of folds the protein around the ligand. Um, which is sort of interesting. And I think it's due, and I'll talk about that in a second. I think that that's maybe due to the way that we trained the network. Um, that basically the network was trained in a way that really heavily favored ligand accuracy over protein accuracy in two different ways. So one of those ways is just this frame issue that I talked about. There's a lot higher density of frames on ligands than there are on proteins. And so it gets more of a bonus for placing the ligand. And also two other things. We trained on this CSD data, which is just ligand molecules. And it saw a significant fraction of that. I think 15% of the data that it saw was from CSD in training. That obviously, again, really told the network to quickly converge ligands. And then the third thing we did, and this was in hindsight, not a smart thing. Our newest model, version four of this model is doing this differently, but we actually upweighted um, the intra-ligand and protein ligand interactions relative to the intra-protein interactions. So for the FAPE, there's a certain uh, weight associated um, with each edge, and we basically upweighted the edges of the intra-ligand intra and ligand protein. And we think that was a mistake, but all of these reason, regions, all of these three things lead to basically the, the model folding protein, uh, folding ligand before protein. All right, yeah, last thing, this is just kind of the overall data. And again, what you're seeing here is, I just wanted to show kind of this, this plot. It kind of shows some of the same data I showed before, so it's not, but this plot here is kind of everything. Um, what we find, two, two points, again, what we find is roughly 30% success rate, okay? Where about, yeah, 28 to 30% of ligands are placed within two angstroms of their native, uh, of their native position. And that's trying to, we basically superimpose pocket residues and then compute the RMS of the ligand. Um, but what's neat is like the DNA RNA network is the model has some sense of accuracy. And specifically what I'm plotting is the predicted error across the protein ligand interface. And then I'm plotting that as a function of the ligand RMS. And you can see again that there are, you know, the model definitely, in I would say it's not, it's not, the error prediction is definitely not as good as in the nucleic acid case, um, but there's definitely enrichment for correct things. So if you only consider interactions with very low predicted error, you enrich to a significantly higher percent. Um, I think it's sort of closer to 70% uh, of things, again, depending on what cutoff you use, but for the round, if you use a this error estimate of 10, this PAE of 10, you get about 70% of things that are sub two angstroms uh, compared to the native. And I will say, I should have probably showed a slide that did this. But I think that what we, another thing that we find really interesting about this network is in a lot of the cases that it gets it wrong, it still finds the right pocket where the ligand goes. Like if the accuracy of the pocket, I would say is pretty good. I wish I knew the exact number. The accuracy of finding the pocket is good. The accuracy of getting the exact configuration of the molecule is significantly lower. So there are many cases where it finds the right pocket, but builds the molecule incorrectly. Um, basically. And there's a number of reasons for that. Some of it is, I think, energetically, sometimes it just does things that clearly don't make sense. Having the model, like again, the native makes three hydrogen bonds, it'll flip it, the molecule in a way where shape complementarity is good, but it's not making any hydrogen bonds. So we have some ideas on, on possibly, you know, enforcing the network to make use of that, actually putting that in even as a loss function. Um, uh, but then there are just other cases where we have nearly symmetric molecules, things that are, are relatively hard to get. So yeah, basically, like I said, we're constantly working on this. Um, we want to, and especially again, the recent publication from ISO, isomorphic has shown like probably we can do better on this task. And so we're really interested in trying to push this model more. And I think there's basically a couple of ideas that we're exploring kind of in in this next round. And so the first is the idea of self-distillation data, right? Where you basically train a network as good as you can. 
You use that network to make predictions and then use those predictions as additional training data, which again, sounds kind of circular, but there are a couple of reasons that I think it does make sense. You can make the problems tougher in self-distillation. So the idea is you would do this big databases of protein ligand interactions without known structure, right? We can do this. Um, we can do this with, uh, uh, with our current network where we predict all of these structures, we find the very high confidence predictions and then use those as additional training data. And again, it doesn't make a ton of sense to, again, it's sort of, it seems circular. The network already gets these things. Why does training with it? But I think one of the things is you can make the problem harder, right? We're masking things right away. The masking makes things harder. Um, and also, again, I think it helps sort of generalization performance of the network. The network is kind of always has to fill in where there's no information, right? It filled in some of the some of those wrong areas right. It filled in some of those areas wrong. Now we locked down some of these points, and so we are we're filling some of this data in. Um, second thing we're trying is mass token recovery of 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 um, of atoms. And again, at first we didn't like I said. So normally Rosetta Fold masks proteins, and that and then so so fifteen percent of amino acids get masked, and then we ask the network to predict what those mass tokens were. And it, uh, we didn't initially do that for ligands because it kind of didn't make sense. Like we're doing something, you know, you're masking uh, an atom. You don't know what that atom is. It's kind of weird to think that the network should be able to figure that out. But I think it does help the network. Um, it does help the network learn that kind of, I think the energetics more, the, the sort of sequence structure or the, uh, atom structure relationship a little bit better. And so we're trying that. This was actually motivated by the fact we tried doing this just at inference time. And there were a couple of cases where masking tokens would would enable finding the correct solution. Um, whereas if you didn't mask these tokens, mask tokens, it would always find the wrong solution. Uh, there's just, like I said, there's a ton of things, parameters of this model that are just guesses from our perspective. And so we wanna try exploring some of those a little bit more. And then the other thing is model ensembling. I just wanna talk real quick about two of these things. One of the things, this idea of self-distillation has made a huge impact in terms of protein DNA um, structures. And so basically what we've done is we've taken a large amount of transcription factor data and used that as a self-distillation data set um, and used it in two different ways. First as sort of self-distillation examples. And secondly, as um, again, binder versus non-binder prediction and using that as like an auxiliary task that the network predicts. The long story short is that this model helps. So I'm showing overall LDDTs and it doesn't really look very good, but if you look at interface quality, you can see there's a significant improvement between our published model and now this self-distilled model as shown here. Um, and then I wanted to talk, the last point is about model ensembling. And one of the interesting things that we've done is that we've trained, we have multiple models. And so one of the things that we did is went back and look at these models. And what we find is that these models, and this particularly is a model that was recently trained after to the, so the bioarchive paper was published last November. Um, and then a, a model was more recently uh, trained since then. It was largely similar than the architecture. The main difference I think was the fraction of examples from each different training pool were changed. Like, so the CSD structures were removed from this network. Um, and I think it was a little more protein heavy and a little more small molecule light. Um, but that was the, the main difference. Like architecturally, the network was the same. And one of the things that we found is that both of these networks had very similar accuracy. So this is the pose, but this is a different training data set. This is this pose busters training data set. But we find that both networks have about 39% accuracy. But when you look, so this is a scatter plot of RMSs, model one, right? Versus model two. Let me, sorry. Yeah, this is from the paper. This is from the more recent model that we published. Um, what you can do is if you ensemble these methods, you see fairly non-trivial improvements. So basically what happens is there are many cases where only one of these two models can get the correct ligand placement, but the model knows when it gets the correct ligand placement. So what we're doing here is we're running both models and we're saying whichever one has the lowest predicted, self-predicted error we're going to take. So there's no parameter, it's just saying this model thinks it has an error of PAE of six, this model has a PAE of 12, we take the one with six. Um, and that increases 
you can see that there's a lot of cases that it gets better and very few that it gets it wrong. And so we, we see our success rate again, success, uh, RMS below two, we go now to close to 50% success. And so one idea of how to improve this model is not to try to improve a single model, but it's just to try ensembling more. So build five models, change the ratio of training data set. I mean, that obviously is very, very inefficient. This model is pretty expensive to train, but it's one idea. And so one of the things that we're going to be looking at going forward as we try these different ideas is also trying ensembling these models and seeing if that gives us uh, better improvements. So I think well, with that, I'm that. Done. yeah. And my other fold always does that they made five models and, uh, yeah. they, and, yes. they, and, and then they run at five, five five uh, different random seeds for each model so they, they, yes. they do 25 so yeah so i mean and then of course i mean last cast beyond valna did this six thousand models whatever it did but yeah uh, <laughs> yeah you're, you're, you're using random seeds and i mean when we look at it like yes yeah, somewhere around yeah you know 50 models of that you yeah. basically plateau out i mean you you, you get some improvement but like you gain yeah. quite a lot from the first 50. yeah so if you look at well, that i mean it's kind of it's kind of interesting because with Rosetta Fold for proteins, we didn't see a humongous shift in things. We, I mean, we see subtle improvements, but when we go, we, what we see, I think, again, this plot, I think is surprising. When we do this for, say, alternately trained Rosetta Fold models, there's a much tighter correlation here. There's very few points that are off this diagonal, right? And that's one thing that, that I think we do find that was kind of a little surprising here. And I think probably it's because the success rate is so low. And it is, it's the model really has to generalize far from what's training. But yeah, I, this is what we want to do. I mean, it's not like, great. I don't know, for me, like saying, well, the model itself is five models, but you can imagine, you know, having five models and then training a selector on top of that or something like that. There's also some tricks, I think, where people actually can train models and then can combine the weights, which sounds really hacky, but can combine the weights in a certain way that allows the model to... Um, it basically allows it to be one model at the end of the day. Um, the point is we're just interested in, in getting this. It can be inefficient and hacky. If we can figure out what makes this work, that will be helpful. So I, I want to thank a ton of people, uh, the bolded people, especially for the work on this. So Rohit and Ju are largely the minds behind Rosetta Fold All Atom. Ryan has done most of the work behind the uh, nucleic acid stuff. And then Mink Young, of course, did develop the original Rosetta Fold and has been continuing to help out with the nucleic acid work. Um, yeah. With that, with that, I'm happy to take any questions that people yeah. might have. So there, there are some questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to read out them yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, Let me see. I, I can do it, but there was many okay. people asked them. I thought in the first one, Hani asked, what kind of resources did you need for training? So how, how expensive is it? So it was 60, it's basically 64 GPUs for a month is basically what it takes to train this network. Um, and a lot of that is like, again, I think if you saw the, uh, but anyway, a lot of that is is the last couple percent of performance. Like the network in a week gets to be pretty good performing, but then to get that last sort of, you know, 5%, it spends a lot of time, but it's about, so again, a full training run takes on 64 GPUs takes about a month. Yeah, I mean, that's what Openfold says also. You can, you can do it like 10% of the data, you get, yeah, you get 9% of performance or something, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And Maria asked, uh, how do you choose hyperparameters for such a big model? Right, is it, did you so just... that's a great question. And that's something, so the, one of the problems is we don't have like enough GPU. Like we basically have GPUs that we can have one training fund going at a time. Um, we don't really, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to think. So if possible, we do try to like tune certain things. Um, so one of the, oh, I don't want to say this. I, I would say it varies a lot depending on hyperparameters. If there's like alternate tests that we can do that without training that can give us a good guess at hyperparameters and some of the hyperparameters we can do that. So some of the loss function stuff, you can actually do minimization of like random point clouds and that helps tune. That was one of the ways that we found that the, probably the upweighing ligand interactions was hurting us. That if you take a random point cloud and minimize it against faith loss, it works a lot better if you don't reweigh things, for example. So that's kind of one way uh, to tune things. The other way is just to kind of, if a training one run sputters out, you change something and see if that rescues it. And that, um, I would say our parameters are far from optimal at 
this point. It's it's a lot of guessing and it's a lot of like find a value of this that seems to work reasonably well. So for things like the weights, when we initially trained this network, we kind of tweaked, as we were running, we tweaked the rates, tweaked the weights so that all of the loss terms were dropping basically. So if a loss term wasn't dropping in the course of like initial training, we would increase the weight on that. Like tricks like that. I would love to be able to do a full like hyperparameter sweep, but it really is because we just, a run is so expensive. We can do one run at a time. It's, it's not something that we can feasibly do. Um, so so and someone I, should donate 64,000 EPOCU. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Are multiple ligands simultaneously possible is the next question. Yes. In fact, in training, we do that. If there's multiple ligands um, in the crop, they're modeled all separately. It has no problems building with model, multiple ligands. So if I ask RFAA to build to model lipid or glycerol, will it predict them properly? That's a really, uh, sorry. If I ask RFAA to model a lipid or glycerol, will it predict them properly even though they were avoided during training? It could help people to process unexplained map patches and experimental density faster. That's a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I suspect, at least at a geometry level, it certainly, I think, models like the geometry of a glycerol, it'll model that correctly. The interactions itself, it's difficult to know. I, I mean, one of the things is like, I think these sort of weak kind of crystallographic interactions are generally poorly predicted anyway. So I'm not sure of the answer to that, to be honest. I think like, again, the geometry of it, certainly it will get that correctly. I don't know how well it would work at predicting the interactions of those. Um, and I think, uh, yeah. I guess that basically boils down to question how much, um, I mean, how much is the MSA or the many protein information guiding your um, binding pocket prediction somehow? Because certainly glycerol doesn't have any evolutionary information or many exactly. cells. Well, so no, that's and that's the issue. There is no for anything atomized. There is no evolutionary. I mean, there's no MSA, right? It's a single. It's just in the single sequence. The yeah. but, but somehow sequence. I guess the protein might learn that this is a binding site anyway from the, from the MSA of the protein. Correct, and so, so that's, that's, that's where it's yeah. preserved yeah. site yeah. in the surface basically. Yeah. It's sort of like they know I want to put something there. It's like, and that's yes. of course not the case for glycerol for crystallization. Exactly. So I think that's part of it, and like I said, things that are are weaker energetically seem to be poorly predicted as well. So. I, I don't know. I mean, it's worth looking at. We have not looked at that, unfortunately. I, I, I um, guess one way you could test that, maybe, if, is if, if you use a template for the protein in a single sequence mode. Yeah. So, and then oh. you don't know, like a binding from that. Maybe, maybe, do you know how you try that? How much would you lose? Some... We've, so we've tried that. And I think that helps the performance kind of marginally. Um, I mean, part of the issue is it is getting <laughs> proteins mostly right most of the time um i think when we template the protein um like i said it does it does do better but there are again there are a decent number of cases where it just doesn't know where the ligand goes it gets the protein mostly right and it just still do it doesn't know where the ligand goes and if you template with the right protein it still doesn't know where the ligand goes uh, in those cases it, it helps and we didn't look at this much and part of it is we really want this to um we really want this to be to generally, we really are more focused on the general problem than just specifically the ligand docking. Um, but it, it helps surprisingly little. Like that, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think we get up to the problem is we have like three different data sets, but I think it's sort of like a five to ten percent improvement in prediction quality if we template the the structure. Which again, so, it helps, but not a ton. It helps in cases. There are definitely some cases where the protein structure is pretty incorrect. Um, I'm gonna say pretty incorrect. It's still the fold is right, but it's like the pocket is pretty wrong. Um, and in those cases, it, it, there's a couple of cases there where it can help, but like for the most part, it I think it it really when it fails to find the ligand, it it just fails to find the ligand placement. Okay, so the CSD questions: Did I filter the CSD data in any particular way? I think what we just did was take like our factors that were below 0.05, um, and I think that was it. Uh, and then did they use the crystalline graphic? Did you use the crystallographic environment of molecules from CSD to infer interligand interactions? So no, that was something we always wanted to do, but we it, it was kind of a pain to get it working correctly and to get a, actually the hard part was the loss function. So like, like right, the, the issue is that these CSD molecules, they're in a lattice um, and uh, like that lattice is probably driving their confirmation in some way, uh, but we didn't, 
We never did that basically. Um, and in fact, the latest run, we've gotten rid of the CSD data. It seems like the CSD data doesn't really help at all in terms of the protein ligand uh, accuracy um, that we've done. The run four basically eliminated the CSD data and we see no difference in terms of protein. What seems to happen with the CSD is it learns it to a certain level pretty quickly. Uh, like it learns bond lengths and bond angles pretty quickly. And it just seems like that doesn't really help. Um, it could be that using the crystal interactions of those CSD ligands could help. Uh, it's just, it's hard because like, yeah, it, again, it's an infinite lattice. We can predict multiple copies of it, but then what's the loss function? Defining the loss function in a way that's reasonable is I think really, really, or can be somewhat challenging. We, we, it's definitely worth thinking about, I think, um, for sure. But we haven't, we, it's, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? There is, yes, yeah. Stefan. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe, I don't know if, uh, I missed a few minutes of your talk, but I don't know if you mentioned yeah. it, but for proteins that have a large conformational change upon binding of ligands, yes. let, let's say like calcium binding proteins, yes. uh, would that improve, let's say, for example, if you try to predict the proteins without the ligand, it will give you the closed conformation, yeah. and then That's you a redo the same prediction with the ligand and now you get the open confirmation. So, that's a great question. That was what we were hoping coming into this that we would see. And we actually kind of do see that with DNA binding proteins, right? That they predict, again, just a random cluster of domains. You put the DNA in and it organizes itself around the DNA. We don't really see that, unfortunately, with this data. Unfortunately, it seems to predict one confirmation regardless of whether or not you put the ligand in there it seems to have settled in on either like the apo or the holo and then it, it kind of there's subtle movements like there are definitely some cases where like a loop will move out of the way but i think for the most part the predictions are pretty similar whether or not the ligand is present and that's a huge that's definitely something we want to fix. Like that was one of the dreams of this is that even if it's not great if it can predict conformational changes that would be really, really useful. And so we're, one of the things that we're thinking of doing is doing basically fine tuning runs where, you know, there are data sets that give us some information on that. I mean, there's definitely pairs of structures, not a ton, but enough pairs of structures that show these conformational changes. There's also like lots of data for these like fragment drug screens that show conformational flexibility of the protein surface. And so what we're our plan for this is to try to fine tune with a very high frequency of those pairs of molecules and evenly weighted so it sees all of these different conformations. And our hope is that maybe the network can like soften and learn now these ligand guided conformational changes. But I think currently the current version of the network doesn't really do that or maybe, maybe to a very, very limited extent, basically. There was one more question in the chat here. Any comments on Neural Plexer 2? Are they using the additional information that Rosetta is using, or is it just different network architecture? I have no idea. But <laughs> Yeah, I unfortunately, I can't. I, I don't know the details of this um, enough to, to, to uh, yeah, I, I really don't know the details of this enough. Um, my guess is it's probably, uh, I, I don't want to speculate, but, but like my guess is it's a, a lot of these methods are sort of just different network architectures, right? I think at the end of the day, they're not using, you know, the, there's only so many ways to encode this information. And so, yeah, but I, I don't know I, enough I, details. I, I, I guess speculate. the related question is like, what yeah. do you think out of latest is also basically the same architecture, um, the same ideas? So I, I suspect so. So the, it, that's obviously been like a huge discussion at, at IPD, and I've given a lot of thought to this. I, my guess is it's a very similar, based on what they've, the brief snippet that they released, I think it's it's a similar architecture, similar setup in terms of training that atoms are atomized and residues are residuized. Um, my guess is that there's just a lot more clever engineering at a lot of different levels. I think probably the distillation data, I mean, for DNA, we already see that the use of the self-distillation improves things to where I think we're in line with their model now. And so I think the idea is to get the self-distillation data for ligands online. I think for like RNA, we're really not very clever with the way that we're generating uh, MSAs. I think probably there's a lot more clever ways to generate 
MSAs for RNA structure that would probably help our predictions quite a bit. Um, so that's another sort of P. I think there's just like, there's lots of room for some clever engineering bits. I don't think, my guess is that it's not any anything substantially different in terms of machine learning architecture, but it really is just like, again, getting the right training data, getting the right losses, getting the right balance of things, maybe doing some massive ensembling. Again, uh, that, I mean, maybe it is five models is all that we need to get there, but yeah. Okay. But I don't, I, but I don't think they're doing anything substantially, but I don't know. Well, no way of knowing. Ho hopefully we'll get a paper out sometime. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, and the last question is code publication very, very soon. It's just, it's taken, getting the code in a state that it's not 50 scripts tied together has taken a while. Um, we're hopeful that the code will be published like definitely, ideally in the next two weeks, um, realistically, probably within the next month. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's not, there's no like nefarious thing or anything. It's just literally right now, it's like 50 different scripts for every different mode it's a different script and we're trying to clean this up so that it's one script that you run and it can predict all of these things basically. So very, very soon we're working on that right now. Yeah. Okay. Th I think that's it. No more questions. I think well, you, you, we, in Europe, we go back and go home and have dinner and you go Asia, I guess they go to bed and you go and have breakfast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Emma. For me, this was a really good one, talk. And, um, yeah. I'm, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.